get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same like right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And and I'm going to introduce Kelly Johnson in a second. Kelly, I always like to mention past episodes that are interesting. And some of the ones that are top of mind today for me, Andrea Houston, she's founder of Artitude's Design, and she hosts the Lead Like a Woman show. She's coming out with a book. so And she's just an amazing human being. She should probably have you on her show also, Kelly. And Andrea Herrera of Boxperience. She delivers customized wooden crates filled with goodies. I geek out on cool direct response packages that are joyful. And that's exactly what she provides. And uh, Julie Clark, um, I did that one a while ago, founder of Baby Einstein. Um, she grew it to $20 million with five employees, sold to Disney. But the most, the most interesting part and inspiring part was she calls herself a cancer assassin. So she battled cancer twice and she doesn't like survivor. She likes assassin because it empowers her. So um, that and many more, check out inspiredinsider.com. And this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And I co-founded Rise25 with my business partner, John Corcoran. And we're always on a mission to help build relationships and further relationships. And what we do is we help people connect to their dream 100 relationships by helping them run their podcast. And for me, Kelly, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships. And I've seen no better way over the past 10 years to profile the people and the companies I admire on my podcast. So if you've thought about podcasting, go to rise25.com. We've been doing it for over a decade. Um, today's guest, I'm really excited, uh, Kelly Johnson. Um, if left to my own devices, Kelly, I feel like this interview would go for three hours because there's so much to talk about from my research. But Kelly Johnson founded the Ballast Group, and it's an award-winning integrated communication strategy firm. And this is after she served as director of corporate marketing for Abbott Laboratories, managing corporate communications for Tropicana, which if you've heard of it, and most people have, it's a multi-billion dollar division of Pepsi. Um, and the Ballast Group basically helps build domestic brands of global companies, provides lead generation and growth strategies for startup companies as well. And they're focused on all aspects of marketing consumer products, healthcare, high tech, and they've helped companies that we've all heard of, Hyatt, Kaiser Permanente, you know, Permanente Stericycle, Safeway, Target, Cisco, and many, many more. And they position companies as thought leaders. And you know, they can, they've gotten their clients into the US News, News and World Report, Wall Street Journal, CNN, and, and so many more. And, you know, Kelly, what's also impressive is you give back. It's not like you're just running your company. You are a mentor for DePaul University's Coleman Entrepreneur Center. Um, 1871, you're on the board of the Lynn Sage Cancer Research Foundation and even former Rollins College Board of Trustees. So Kelly, thanks for joining me. Absolutely. It's an honor to be here. And um, I really appreciate what you're doing, Jeremy, for a lot of people. And um, I'm excited to be here. Uh, you know, the, you just, you have this combination of kindness, expertise, and authority. Um, and when we talked before, I was like, what's top of mind? And you said team pipeline and client satisfaction. So expand on that for, for a second and what you mean by that. Yeah. Every day as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, um, as a person, right. I think of my team and, and team could be everybody around us all day long. In the business sense, it's obviously my team and I have a unique business model. So my team could go anywhere at any time, right? Um, uh, we were the first cloud-based PR firm, you could say medical technology PR firm 17 years ago when we started. We didn't really know what to call it back then, but now it's pretty much morphed into becoming the cloud-based environment in the gig economy. And so your, my team could go anywhere, right? They, they could work for many different organizations. Um, we pull in subject matter experts to help us. We serve a lot of complex industries that are highly regulated. So whether it's um, healthcare, medical, high tech, um, it, it calls for expertise. And so I have a core four, I call it, right? And there's probably eight of us at any given time working on projects, um, but I pull in those subject matter experts. They may give, give our ballast group five to 10 hours a week, um, but it allows me to 
fill the client's uh, needs pretty efficiently and bring in the expertise that I might not be able to hire. Um, and it also allows me to put my team, um, the right team into what the client needs rather than what I have as an employee. So the cloud-based model has always been a part of it. I checked in every year. One, uh, first two questions I asked myself, can I find the right talent? pretty consistently and do the clients care that we're cloud-based? We can work from anywhere in the world. Um, the answer is I always find the right talent, amazing people all across the country and the clients don't care as long as you get results. So that, that teamwork, um, the pipeline as an entrepreneur, you always know you cannot rest on your laurels. You have to um, constantly be thinking about the pipeline and how you build relationships and um, to keep things moving. And then of course, client satisfaction. They don't care that we're cloud-based or where our team works because we get results. So it's that constant communication with all of these different stakeholders that jazzes me. I wanna dig a little bit deeper in each one of those. So the team side and hiring talent, go back to when it was just you and talk about kind of the formation of the core values when, um, you know, walk me back to the time of why you decided on certain core values yeah, I mean, when, I, when it was just me, so um, I had a bad boss syndrome, which every one of us has at least once in our career, and it was the catalyst for me to start my company. And I'd been working for at least 18 to 20 years at that point and realized life is too short. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm traveling all across the world right now. I have a three hour commute when I am home in Chicago. This is not what I want for the next 20 years. And the bad boss made it more imperative to look for values. Like people, that supported what I was after. So I started um, brainstorming, like what would these values be? Now it didn't come out till about five years after I started Ballast, but it's uh, the first and foremost in our field of PR, which is a creative field, blending art and science, you have to have curiosity or you'll go down very quickly because every project is different, every client's different. Even how you manage your team, you have to be creative and be curious and always wonder. So that was the first value. And then I've played sports my whole life. I do look when we hire, to fill the, the team with people who have been a team player because we always have to have each other's backs. We, we know what we need to do on our projects, but there's times when people need to step in or just offer ideas that are outside of their realm. So that teamwork is huge. Um, I race sailboats too, hence the ballast term is an engineering term for the weight of a ship that can keep things moving, steady and in the right direction. So um, sailing is probably one of the best teamwork sports ever. You've got mother nature and, and um, a lot of crazy factors and variables that go into that. So having um, the the, um, the teamwork is critical and then accountability. And, and, and I have five, but those three drive us every single day and accountability is do what you say you're gonna do. And if you can't, I'll quickly pivot and tell the team and the why may not matter as much as let's let's move forward and look for the right solution. So curiosity, um, a teamwork and accountability. And then you'd think the, the last two would be obvious, honesty and transparency, but they're not always. And I've found in my career, as you probably have, Jeremy, that um, people don't always do what they say they're going to do. And um, they're not transparent and they're not honest. And I find if you have those values that just drives everything you do and then you attract the right people for the team, as well as the right type of clients that you want to work with. What's in your hiring process, Kelly, that allows you to vet for these core values? Because I know they're really important to you. Yeah. Uh, well, we ask, give us examples of teamwork, accountability, curiosity. And if it doesn't come top of mind, if they have to really dig deep for the answer, I sort of go, hmm, um, interesting, right? And it doesn't really catch people off guard as much because um, those three things are in our every day. They're woven into our fabric if you look for them. And so um, we ask the questions in the interviews. We look for it on the resume. Teamwork is pretty obvious. I don't care if it was a debate team or a soccer team or some type of teamwork to say that you've got, you understand what you need to do, but you also have your, your teammates back to step in when something might be needed. And, um, and we test the water. So because of our model, which is cloud-based gig economy, um, we can say, let's do this statement of work. Let's perform for our client. Um, and if we like it and we, we gel together, then there'll be many, many more opportunities to put you on the ballast group team. And so it's sort of this trial and error. They're checking us out as much as we're checking them out and, and checking out the right fit. Um, it's pretty seamless to our clients. And um, I think you're going to start to see more of the cloud-based economy, gig economy mindset in our, our workers, in our teams. Talking about team, 
talk about your collegiate experience um, as a volleyball player. You have a bunch of really interesting fun facts about you. So uh, you're a twin yes. and you were a college volleyball player and you both played together. So yes. talk about how being a volleyball player in your collegiate experience um, influenced you. And I would love to hear your thoughts on also being a twin and going to the same college and being on the same team and uh, how that affected you. Well, it's interesting. Um, being a twin, we're identical, by the way. We're not fraternal. So we look, act, talk, everything the same. My mother at 88 years old still has a hard time with our voices. So <laughs> I say, when I say, hi, mom, I go hi, low. And Jolie goes, mom. So that was how she told, told us apart for the longest time. Jolie, Jolie works for the airline industry. And so she was always traveling. And then I started traveling as much as she did for work. So she couldn't, you know, find out which twin it was by asking where we were <laughs> and which one was traveling and which one wasn't. But when you're identical at, from birth, you know, you hear people say Jolie Kelly, same thing. That's her name, Jolie. And after about a decade, I thought, well, yes, we look alike, but we're different minds and hearts and, you know, experiences over time. So I didn't like to be lumped into Jolie Kelly, same thing. So over time, when I started writing and really loving the, the PR field after an internship at Rollins College, where I went to undergrad and played that volleyball, um, I started thinking I could do this for other people. I love storytelling. And it always starts with, well, how are you different? What are you doing new and sexy or unique or what makes you stand out? And so I realized I had a life of doing this to myself and with Jolie. Um, and I think, you know, we didn't consciously determined to go to college together as twins. Um, it, it so happened to be that. Rollins is an amazing small private liberal arts school in central Florida. And we kind of grew up on the campus because my mother worked there. And, um, you know, what did a, she do? I have a humble upbringing. So my mom was in the alumni office and um, she she liked the job, but I think it was a job necessary. A single mom of four kids, um, wow. not making much money ever in her life annually, um, which taught me my work ethic and my curiosity and creativity to go find what I wanted and the importance of higher education. I mean, you can see from my background at DePaul and serving on the Rollins board and um, getting my master's degree that I really value higher education. So I think it separates the pack. And even with the crime across America in Chicago, Jeremy, where we live, um, you know, education separates people and, and, and changes lives. And so that's, that's what um, is important to me. What were some of the lessons you learned from your mom? And it could have been, you know, something she said, or it could just be observing because I can't imagine, first of all, having four kids, second of all, being a single parent of four kids, the combination that is uh, daunting, just thinking about it. My mother is pretty phenomenal. You know, she um, she's a Syracuse grad, which is number two, number one program behind PR compared to DePaul. So we I later in life could, could spar about, you know, Syracuse, DePaul, what's better for my field and laugh about it. She always told me there's nothing you can't do. I'll support you no matter what. And, and if we get into a couple personal, really personal topics that have shaped my life in this podcast, um, I will tell you that there's never been a time where she hasn't um, said that whatever you want, I'll support you. I trust you. And so this was the mindset that we grew up in. And it's you know the nothing you can't handle made me figure things out. Like I want to learn. I'm going to be curious. I want to be a team player and figure all these things out because curiosity makes the world go around, but it also is so important in my field. Was there a personal moment that stands out for you of advice oh, yeah. that she <laughs> I always wanted to be a biological mom. And so um, I dated this gentleman in Chicago and I thought it was the reason I moved to Chicago and he already had his kids. And, um, and I said, well, this is what I want. I want a family too. But I was in my late thirties at that point and career had been very important to me and I was traveling a lot. So it was 38 when I woke up to say, oh my gosh, this is important to me. How do I make this happen? And then after three years of saying, Hey, what are we doing? Are we going to get married and have kids? Um, and he said, yes, well, let's spread it out. I'm like, well, I'm 38. I did the math 41. Okay. That's going to be a little challenging. So I ended up ending the relationship and it killed me. Like it was really the hardest thing I ever had to make a decision on because I love this man. And, but having family of my own was really important too. So um, my mother, I flew to Florida and we were in the car and I thought I'll ask her now because we're driving and the eyeballs are forward and not looking at each other. Hey mom, what would you think if I had a baby on my own? And 
she didn't even hesitate. She goes, if that's what you do want to do, Kelly, I will support you. And it was such like, I had weight off my back, like, okay, that was my first and most important hurdle to clear. And then I started doing research. And what happened next was um, going back to Juliet at Baby Einstein, which is a company I really respect. Um, I think classical music does grow the brain at a very young age. Um, she was a cancer assassin. So I started looking into having a baby on my own. And one of the doctors said, hey, come back next week with a clear mammogram. And I said, sure, see you then. So I hadn't had one in a year and I'm 41 at this time and I did not get a clear mammogram. So that led to a, a diagnosis of early stage breast cancer, which you know was so shocking to me because I try to live my life pretty clean and healthy um, to a fault sometimes and it still happened to me. So the good news was it was so early that we caught it and the treatment wasn't bad at all. Uh, a couple surgeries, but I was very, very lucky. And it's one in eight women today. And so basically um, it's happening a lot. And I believe it's stress and chemicals in our environment, but um, everybody has a different take on it. And so it really separated me. But if I hadn't wanted to be bold to try to have a baby on my own to reach this dream that I've always had of being a biological mom, I would never have discovered um, uh, that I had early stage. I could have discovered it at stage two or three and then had to go through chemo and radiation on top of surgery. So I feel very blessed that being bold and curious did probably save my life. Yeah, that decision could have just saved your life. It's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, talk about your work with the Lynn Sage Cancer Research Foundation. Yes. So there's many cancer foundations out there. I think Lynn Sage does some unique things and I wasn't ready the first year of being a patient. I had to get through the patient mindset to say, okay, I'm great. I'm coming out on the other side. I'll be stronger than ever. I've learned so much. Now I want to give back and I want to be an advocate. And so Lynn Sage, I had a friend um, who had a baby shower and her mother-in-law came to the shower and we started talking and I told her my story and she said, this happened to my daughter too. And I, I had a friend named Lynn Sage. So she's one of the four that are still best friends with, that were best friends with Lynn that are still driving this foundation 30 years later. Um, and that raised about a million or so a year through, um, used to be Northwestern University, a school of medicine, and now it's, um, it's, it's others. And we give about a million dollars a year for research. There's uh, partnerships in other countries. So it goes beyond just Chicago, even though there's some grassroots programs in Chicago. And it's, a, it's an incredible team. So um, this is now my, gosh, fifth year, I think, as a, as a board member. And it's a great group of, of people. Yeah, I want to point out there's a previous episode I did to uh, with Johnny Immerman of Immerman Angels. And um, I don't know if it's the largest, like, peer to peer, they match you with cancer survivor of trying to match you with the same type of cancer, but it's an amazing organization. So if anyone's listening, check out Immerman Angels and it's completely free actually. So, um, you know, thanks for sharing that, Kelly. It's a, it's crazy, remarkable journey, how a decision can be life altering in so many ways. So we talk about team, we talk about pipeline. And when you talk about pipeline, what has been effective for you as far as pipeline goes? Yeah, you can never rest on your laurels. So I, I, I stepped out about four years ago to work on the business instead of in it. And I have such a great team. I'll give a shout out to Rebecca Summers, who's my right hand person, who's just amazing. I found her through DePaul University years ago. And um, the pipeline, though she and the team allow me to step out and work on that pipeline every day. So if I'm not, it used to be Fridays, right? When I first started my company, every for the first five years, it was every Friday I'd save the afternoon, which was a happy time because the weekend was coming to work on biz dev. And so I would call people and and say, hey, how are you? Where, what are you doing? What are you up to? What are you launching? What big problem do you have? Um, you know, sometimes it would be companies that were launching. And I found this niche in healthcare and medical technology startups. And it became 1871 Chicago, the world's um, largest uh, tech incubator and other universities where I would find leads of these startups. And then I joined a group called Provisors, a uh, nationwide networking um, organization of about now 6,500 people that are lawyers, CPAs, real estate, financial services, marketing and PR people like me, we each have our lane. And the idea is you refer clients to each other because you're a trusted advisor. So 
um, a lawyer might have a need for his or her client that he hears in conversations. Oh yeah, we're going to go public or we want to acquire a company or we want to be acquired. Um, how, who can you help? Who, who knew that can help us? So it's a, it's an amazing um, 30 year old group started by one lawyer and one CPA that said we can trade clients back and forth. And so a lot of my, our leads come from there as well as relationships. I can't underscore enough. Um, never stop networking. It's a lifelong uh, um, trait and characteristic that will propel, you know, the really extraordinary from the ordinary and keeping relationships and nurturing them when you don't need something. It's about um, giving and getting all the time. And, and the reason I love provisors is because that is the business model is the give and get. Um, and so the pipeline became a focus of mine when I actually could step out and work on the business instead of in it. You know, um, yes. That's how we met, actually, through Provisors, and um, I, I also, you know, echo that with Provisors and being in a group, any group that you're looking to add value to people first um, is always a great group. And the next one, so team pipeline client satisfaction, and looking at someone can go to the ballastgroup.com. They have a you can go to case dash studies, and I was looking through it, Kelly, on just a treasure trove of all these case studies and. And so I would love for you to walk through when we talk about client satisfaction, because you track everything. And I'd love for you to talk through a few, and maybe let's start with the, uh, there was a medical simulation. Yes. Uh, so basically I worked with a company out of Denver, Colorado, great pioneering CEO from Baxter decided to, ha- uh, to start a startup and, um, It was to help doctors practice on simulated patients instead of real patients, because that's where medical errors occur. And the company had, let's see, 20 employees when I when I first started working with them, zero revenues, eight years of um, back and forth, you know, trying to do some R&D and get the technology right where it wanted to be. So this technology simulated um, not to get too medical geeky on you, but endovascular procedures. So stenting. So remember when um, stents came out, they could prop arteries open and clear debris and prevent heart attacks uh, or at least or strokes, you know, to try. So it was a pretty complicated um, procedure that these doctors did. So this gentleman got a team together that created software that they, they could emulate the procedure in a catheter lab in a hospital. And it was so real. It's, it's a field called haptic. So it's the force field when you're a doctor and you're threading a catheter through an artery, you can feel the plaque, right? You can feel where that, that um, congestion Technology is. Technology is ama- like amazing. That the fact they can even do that. Yeah. Um, so it was one of the first in the world. And so as a PR person, right, I come in under marketing and PR wasn't really known, but I'm like, yeah, this is one of my secret weapons. PR is amazing when it works well. And I'm still a PR purist at heart where I want to earn the media. I want to talk to a reporter, editor, producer, or blogger and say, hey, this story is worthwhile and here's why. And when you get that, you didn't have to pay to tell it, right? You're not you're um, not on social media, on the networks. It is somebody that gate kept your story and said it was worthy to tell. Um, so earn media is really important. So we had the world's first simulation center up in Seattle from Denver. We flew up there as a team and um, the doctor was phenomenal, very well known in, in the industry. And somehow uh, a CNN reporter want, was interested, right? But the, they didn't have any people available that day, especially to go into a hospital cath lab and watch this technology being done as the world's first simulation center. So they assigned a sports reporter. <laughs> it was so funny. A sports. Uh, a sports reporter. And, you know, this is why I love journalists, because if they're good storytellers, regardless of the beat they cover. So I'm like, this is going to be really interesting. So he ended up producing such a great story um, that went viral and uh, the company was on the map overnight. So it was U.S. News and World Report, CNN Headline News, Popular Science, all these major business journals across the country saying, hey, because the CEO had a vision and we ask this with every client we have now. He taught me a lot uh, when we said, what's your ideal headline? And he said, I want to be on the cover of Fortune as the most feared man in medicine. And I said, hmm, that's a good benchmark. So we got him on um, in the U.S. News and World Report, which is, you know, a page and a quarter, which is about a $200,000 ad value at the time that, you know, he paid pennies for it compared to if you would have had to pay your way into U.S. News and World Report to advertise. So um, it was phenomenal because the company was on the map overnight. It got a lot of attention globally, but the CEO was a very smart CEO and said, yeah, we want to get it right domestically first. Let's launch and roll it out to hospitals and build the company as a result. 
So it was one of my career highlights because I was 32 at the time. And I thought, wow, this is why I love what I do. Because not only this, in this case, was it a life-saving technology and preventing 100,000 medical errors a year from happening, the number is still as high today. Just, they just happen. So he said, you know, if, if CEOs of hospitals know this technology exists and they don't use it for their teams to train on first, um, shame on them, right? So it was a really great experience. You know, and, and we will talk about, I, I heard, you, heard you talk about your peso model. And we will, all of you walk through because it goes into what you had just said about, well, you, you know, earn this, but it's such a good story and they're putting it everywhere. And we'll get to that in a second. Um, but what made this person's story so good? You were, you were impressed with this sports writer when they came out. What did you, what was so good about it? You know, when we work with CEOs, we tell them journalism earned media is difficult. And it's one of the most difficult part of the peso model, paid, earned, shared and owned. The E is the earned. And the reason why is journalists from day one at J school are taught to balance stories. Um, and I know with the past administration and fake news, it got a very bad rap. But I, I in my master's program at the Pointer Institute, part of the University of South Florida, I had a chance to spend a week with world-class journalists at the age of 24 or five. I think I was Tropicana paid for my master's. And as a part of that, I got to sit in with um, Martha Raddatz, who's a Pentagon correspondent, and um, uh, Keith, his last name escapes me right now, but he wrote the uh, biography of Thurgood Marshall. Like these are incredible reporters. And the conversation was around ethics in the field. And, um, and I thought they care, they're very serious. And then part of my master's program, it was why isn't this, this field licensed? And, you know, 30 years later, it's still not a licensed field book, but they have a lot of power and to their words every day influence a lot of different things. And so um, I guess working with journalists has taught me a lot about balance, about fairness, about accuracy. And so when I teach PR at DePaul, I tell the students, look, you know, you don't want a positive story. Of course, that's good, but it's not about positive. It's about fair, accurate and balanced. And if you can walk away with stories that do that, then you're successful. And you, you should tell your boss or your clients or whoever you may be working for that it was successful because it's hard to get a story that um, about your clients, I think sometimes I, I tell my clients that you could be interviewed for an hour and the story doesn't even mention you. Um, the editor at the last minute decided to change the angle. And so they cut your entire interview or the story could be completely about you, which is what we strive to do is to get them in the news for increased attention, investment, customers, and good, good employees. So it is um, a delicate balance. I'm not a journalist. I have a master's in it, but I never wrote um, I very much respect um, the minds and the tenacity. And like I said, the striving and balance that journalists have to do every single day. Like the um, part of the talent and the secret sauce, I feel when it makes, there's many things that make you and the company different, but finding the story like you've always f looked and found the differences when you go into talking to a client, what are some of the methodologies you think about when you're trying to find that? that gem of the story within everything they're, they're telling you? Yeah, sometimes it reveals itself pretty quickly. Other times you have to dig deeper, but we use a methodology that we call the inverted pyramid. So if you take a pyramid and you um, traditionally CEOs and organizations want to be at the top of it and we say, okay, that's fine and good. And you will be, you will shine, but first two things have to happen. And the, that first one is what's your why? Why do you exist? Why are people going to care about this story? And then secondly, who are the third parties that can help you tell it? Because it's that much more credible in the marketplace when, you know, a peer can see their peer talking about you instead of the CEO talking because everyone knows that they drink their own Kool-Aid, right? And I say that with kindness and respect because um, that's what they're ingrained to do. But when you get others to tell your story for you, it's very powerful. I love it. I'd love for you to pull up the peso model um, and we can, I, I, you know, we can walk through it a little bit. Yes. Let me share my screen yeah. here and show you, and I'll try to put this into um, the mode was the inverted pyramid that I had just mentioned. Um, where is my little, hmm. okay. Is that, can you see this? Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. So the peso model stands for paid, earned, shared, and owned. Um, I think a lot in my field now use this model and it, it 
it simplifies the approach of when people say they want marketing or PR, you say, what kind? Because I've got a hundred, hundred different initiatives I can walk you through. So basically um, it's four different campaign types and it helps leaders articulate their stories to their most important audiences and the channels that matter because your audiences lurk in all four buckets and the story sits in the middle. And the first one paid, you know, it's anytime you have to do an exchange a dollar just to, to say what you want to say to attract the right audience. So um, on your website, search engine marketing, search engine optimization, paid social media posts, um, digital strategies like Google searches, et cetera. I don't have to tell you that because I know you're an expert at it, but that's the paid part. What sits in between the paid and earn is what we call thought leadership. Because sometimes you have to pay to tell your story. Other times you don't. And that's where the, when I mentioned that being a pure PRist, uh, purist PR from, from an earned media standpoint, um, I like to, have to convince gatekeepers that your story is important. And so the earned side is the earned. Um, it's third parties, it's influencers, it's social listening, monitoring. So you have to earn that. And it's not easy. Um, and um, I love how you show these kind of intersections there. And that's what I loved about that between the paid and the earned is that thought leadership piece, but yeah, yeah keep going. And there's another one too. So influencer engagement, we did a great project for Peapod years ago. Um, the world's first online grocer happened to be in Chicago and they wanted to beef up the Chicago market a little bit more. And we found 20 foodie Instagrammers that they didn't know before. And the Instagrammers did not know Peapod. Um, and brought them the same room with some really cool chefs to highlight their first um, chef inspired meal kits that you could order at home. So this is the power of influencer is again, you know, we did not pay them a dime today. You can pay $5,000 a post to get a good influencer to tout one of your clients. So um, it was the beauty of a blend of earned media and get building the relationship with, with Peapod with them. So that's the influencers. And then you've got your shared, right? Your social media um, on many different types of platforms. And you have to know what audiences your clients are going after to know which platforms to use most. So is it B2B? Is it B2C? Is it a B2B2C? Is it government? You know, what, what audience? And that's how you would determine what shared media channels to use. And in the, in the shared part, Jeremy, it's important to point out that a lot of people think social media is talking at the world. It is not. That's why they call it shared. It's two-way dialogue. You have to engage. We always say, let's do 80% engagement and 20% informing. So you could talk about you and yourself and your products and organization, but it doesn't really mean anything until you start engaging people. So that's a big part of shared. And then finally, the owned is 100% what you want to say to the world at any given time. And so there's more control. It's safer to a lot of CEOs, but it's less believable because it is going back to the Kool-Aid comment that I made. It's what you expect a company to be saying about itself and its email, its blog, and its website. So I feel like blending the four paid and shared and owns in thought leadership and influencer engagement um, advocacy is where the magic happens. So we do, uh, we're big proponents of integrating all four today. And I think, um, yeah, so that's the peso. I love it. Thanks for sharing that. Will you talk a little bit about services wise? People come to you and they go, we need your help, Kelly. Yes. What are some of the options and how people engage with you? So I first find out what problem they're trying to solve. Are they launching? Do they have a big announcement? Um, do they want to hire? Do they want to be a, a good acquisition target? Um, what, is, what is their goal? And then that's what sh helps shape all of uh, the choices that we have to determine and the budget to the budget and the timeline. So if they have a good budget, then we're probably going to recommend integration of all all paid earned, shared and owned campaigns right from the get go. But if not, we might have to walk um, before crawl before we walk and then and then run later. So we might start with earned media or social media, getting the attention, putting the company on the map. You know, when I was looking at you've had some amazing turning points in your career and your life. One that sticks out is mistakes and a mistake of there was one in case where you talked about set it, you didn't set the proper expectations. And I don't know if you know what I'm referring to, but there was a company where you got results and then it yeah. didn't equate to, so I'll let you talk about I, that. I do remember it. And you know yeah. what, making mistakes is normal. And I feel like that's where we learn the most in life in general. Uh, but we had a, a doctor in Houston, had a new innovative procedure for surgery and um, we were hired to help him and his business partner. We didn't think to ask, how do you define PR, uh, up front? It didn't come out until at the end. I was like, yeah, Kelly, you should have asked that question from day one. So we 
ended up getting, uh, CBS had a couple segments, um, leads started coming in. We didn't ask them how they had the operations and the team in place to handle the increased attention they were going to get from the news media and it backfired. So, you know, it was a pretty expensive procedure, $50,000 a pop. So one call more than pays for what we do. Right. But, but it also is very important to not lose any of those leads that come in because sometimes it's within a five minute window of news, a news story airing that people call and they, they want to learn more. Well, they didn't have the right team to answer the phones, to follow up. So a lot fell through the cracks and the CEO came back and blamed it on us. And we thought, Hmm, Okay, let's see. We can lead horses to water, but we can't make them drink. And it was a very valid eye opener for us to say, hey, let's check with our operations folks to make sure they have the right team in place to handle the increased attention that they're going to get. Um, And the the irony, Jeremy, was um, he paid to play on one CBS clip. And so there was a money exchange to do like an advertorial on top of the earned media. And somehow they sent the check for that, they refunded us because they got the name wrong on air. So they refunded the pay to play part and they sent it to me instead of him. And he was withholding his last invoice. And so my bookkeeper called him. It was such great karma. He said, they said, Hey, um, you know, you still owe us, you're not paying it. So we'll just end up keeping the check that CBS accidentally sent to us as um, part of applying that to your outstanding payment. And he said, okay. (laughs) So it all ended up working out. It came back to you. Yeah, no. The universe wanted to get you paid. Yes. <laughs> what did they expect? What did, where was it? Did they think you were going to help take the calls? Like where was the, their expectation? Yeah. I think that they thought we were part of their sales team and mm. we're not, like, not going to close deals. For gotcha. you. I, mean, I can help you do that, but that's what the lead generation of what PR people do is. Right. Um, and, and they're the ones that have to actually take it to close. They thought you'd handle everything. And then, get on the, I mean, you have to kind of know, well, if we're sending them to a certain number and you are not answering, your team is not answering that number that someone is, I mean, wherever the call to action is, right? Yeah. So I, I mean, guess, I guess we just had never assume. Never assume. And that's why I, I just ask all the time, what's your definition of success? What is your ideal headline right before any project actually starts the kickoff call? Uh, you know, if they can answer those two things succinctly, then we're probably going to have a really great relationship. And we can help them answer it, but I should have asked months ahead. I love that question, the ideal headline, because it allows people to kind of put them in the position of exactly what they want and be have clarity around it. What were some other interesting, when you asked that question, answers that you got? You said the most feared person in medicine was one. On the cover of Forbes is the most feared man in medicine was what Mm. uh, the medical simulation CEO asked. Sometimes CEOs don't know right away. They'll say, I get back to you. And I always find that quite interesting because I love a CEO that's decisive and clear. And so that does tell me something too, if it doesn't come right off or if they don't try, like try to say, if you could come up with that ideal headline right now, what would it be? And then they, they kind of play with you. So if anything, it tells us how we're going to be able to work with them right? Like if they're more cautious or less risk averse or want to think things through quickly instead of just off the top of your head, this is it. Like, mm. like that gentleman did. Any others that stick out to you over the years of someone said, or maybe, maybe they came back to you and they thought it through and they came up with something really interesting. Hmm, I got to think about that. I am looking back at a couple of different case studies here. Um, trying to remember, um, Sometimes our clients in the healthcare space, that they work with the FDA, so they have to be really careful about what they say from a safety and efficacy <laughs> standpoint. Right. So, so some, yeah, I know it's highly regulated. Yeah, yeah, it's so highly regulated. Um, I think, or maybe was, talk about like do this. What has been an actual headline that's been out there since you know, in case they said something that would be regulated, they should not say. What is one that actually showed up um, on the you know after the work done? This is an interesting one. So we have an orthobiologics, a cell therapy client in Colorado. And um, we worked with this reporter during COVID, during vaccinations. It was really hard to get any other type of healthcare story covered, but we got an interview with her. And of course, then the COVID breakup happened the next week. So the story sat in her inbox for three months. We followed back up with her um, because the company did get cleared to do a very small COVID trial with the cell therapy, even though it was for knee pain. Um, is what the real trials were about. And so the headline read, 
that new cell therapy could eliminate total knee replacements. This is a really big lesson for us. Um, we were ecstatic. The team was ecstatic. And then we stepped back and said, whoa, uh, we won't be able to promote this. Like part of PR is you get the story and it's amazing. And then you want to amplify it in all these other peso channels. And in this case, the CEO was excited at first and stepped back and said, yeah, we can't promote this because the FDA is going to come back and say, you're saying you're going to eliminate something that's being done for decades, right? With orthopedic surgeons who that's what they do, right? They don't use cells and syringes. They use um, hammers and chisels and they take your knee out. So you don't have any pain left any, in, um, after each situation, but there are very different ways of getting there. So um, we had to take down that story. And what I will tell you- though, What a bummer. Thank God before it did, one of their biggest potential acquisition partners called and said, we saw the story. We want to talk. We do some diligence on your procedures and your research and your trials. So it was a blessing in disguise, um, hmm. but uh, everything else had to be taken down after that point. Can they ever put a disclaimer on that? I mean, because it's not yeah. you writing it. Yeah. yeah. Which I, and that's where the trickiness of the FDA comes in, because even if you have a disclaimer, you're still promoting something that really shouldn't be said until the, the product's approved, which could be another 18 to 24 months. So it was sort of that. Yes. And then that, oh, it looks like a perfect outcome, but then not. Yeah. So it's delayed gratification. Yes. <laughs> um, first of all, Kelly, thank you. I have one last question. Um, and I just want to thank you. I want to point people to, to the ballast group.com. It's B A L L A S T group.com. Are there any other places online we should point people towards? Uh, you know, I think just storytelling in general is, um, I, I, I would say, Hmm. Uh, part online. So partner partners or academia, um, books, good books, I'm trying to think. Um, hmm, I gotta think about that. Sorry. What did you what did you teach at the principles of PR? So okay. it was everything from crisis to you know earned media to paid. Okay. Awesome. The so my last question is I want you to talk about the rapid antigen COVID test. Because yeah. it's especially top of mind in what you did around that. It was one of our most recent projects. Um, love this team. So it's a scientist who's about 70 years old. I raced sailboats with him in Park City, Utah. And he told me this summer that he, he was coming up with a diagnostic test. And I thought, okay, that's what a lot of people are saying right now. We'll see. So October, November comes around. He said, um, we were narrowed from 700 entries in 38 countries down to the top 20. Let's stay in touch. So we did. January, he calls and said, we're top five. We won a million dollar X prize. I want you to help us announce this. So we had a week's notice. I said, what do you have? He said, we have a logo and we have this announcement. So over a period of 24 hours, five news stories showed up. He got calls from distributors, manufacturers, employers who needed the testing. Uh, rapid, rapid testing is very different from molecular testing where you might take days to figure out instead of minutes. And so his test is super important and there's not many that the, and the FDA was calling for them. So um, employers called wanting to test their employees and tur Turkey and Italy officials called. So if this wasn't a, a reminder of the power of PR and how, when you know what you're doing, you can put a company on the map overnight. I don't know what was. So I'm so excited for him because he's done some amazing things in his career. And I think he's got a lot more left to do. Put fuel on the fire. Everyone check out ballastgroup.com. Kelly, I'm the first one to thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Have a good day. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the